Yellow tinted lenses in a pink gelato. Falling out the window and me back to mine. Always be the one to fight to find. Cause we aim it for the stars, we're a broken heart. Welcome, everyone. We are going to get started in just about 30 seconds. Danya, can you pull up my camera? Okay, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, just a quick note, Danya, I'm not seeing my own uh, person on, this, on, my, on the screen. Um, we're so thrilled you're here. Uh, this is the circular and regenerative interior session uh, as part of the NYC by Design Festival 2021. And today is all about demystifying circular interiors, regenerative design, sustainability principles. What does this really mean? Please put any questions into the chat. We'll be going from now to uh, one o'clock until about 1.45. Um, I think if I had to boil this down to a question, I'd say, what if we designed an irresistible, circular, regenerative and sustainable society. And everything today is going to be about, quote, unpacking. What does that really mean? Where these tenants were a clear cut choice. They were a business model, the preferred business model and the preference for consumers. 
And what does all of this have to do? How does it apply to furniture, furnishings, and textiles? Let me do some quick um, introductions. This is a co collaboration today. Uh, I'm with Mebel Transforming Furniture. We are championing a future of furniture that is sustainable and circular. Our passion is helping to move the conversation about design, use, and business of furniture entirely. We're also thrilled to be co-hosted by the Sustainable Furnishings Council, which is a coalition of manufacturers, retailers, and designers dedicated to raising awareness and expanding the adoption of environmentally sustainable practices across the home furnishings industry. And happy birthday to SFC, which will soon be celebrating its 15th anniversary. And we're thrilled to do this as part of NYC uh, by Design Festival. NYC by Design is trying to, is out to draw significant exposure and opportunity to New York City's multifaceted design disciplines, people, events, and related industries. We have, I'm joined today by two amazing um, colleagues, both experts in their arena. First is uh, Laurence Carr. Laurence is the executive producer and host of her Earth XTV original series, Shay Laurence. And she is the founder, CEO, and creative director of the New York City-based design studio, Laurence Carr, Inc., which specializes in a holistic approach to high-end residential and hospitality environments and in creating, as we'll be speaking about today, regenerative, circular, and wellness-enhancing spaces. And also joined by Jessica Kaur. Jessica is an associate professor of design in the School of Design Strategies at Parsons. And she is co-founder and co-director of PLIA, which is a new initiative based in Long Island City, Queens, that brings designers together to offer beautifully made, low impact and regenerative products for the home. So uh, let's jump right in. We urge you take a look there. Our five, our five organizations are listed and the contact information. I think these can be great resources for the conversation today. Laurence, let's demystify things. Hello, Michael. Great to be here. Welcome, welcome. So tell us, give us, tell us a little more about yourself, your work, and then dive right into, Laurence, what is circular design? And how is it different than sustainable design? And, and of course, we're trying to do this with words and images. Yes, so thanks uh, for inviting me. I'm really happy to, that we are um, presenting this topic today together. Um, so as you said, you know, I, I won't I want to go too much. You know, I'm, I'm the CEO and founder of Laurence Carr Inc. You know, it's an award-winning New York City-based design firm that, as you said, specializes in really regenerative and sustainable interiors that promote health and wellness. We really focus on that. Um, we really believe that um, our health, uh, you know, human health is inextricably uh, linked to uh, planetary health. Um, and in that sense, that's how we design. Um, I'm passionate and real advocate for circular economy. And I work both to, you know, educate within the industry, but also among consumers about the importance of circularity. And as you said, I do this free through my FX TV original series, Chez Laurence, uh, from which we are currently filming uh, the second season. My work as an interior designer and also as a product designer, we started to, I started to design products and collaborating with a few brands. Um, and I am, um, you know, I also love sharing, um, you know, um, and educating through panels like this one. And um, finally, I'm a very proud um, Sustainable Furnishing Council ambassador. Um, so um, what is circular design and how, you know, does this really differ from uh, design, from sustainable design? So just to start, you know, to me, sustainability is about protecting our present and our future. And by that, I mean, you know, at the same time, it's like a way of life um, in which I believe we consume consciously, we seek out healthy materials, and we invest in a real culture of wellness. 
sustainability is how we work toward ecological balance by minimizing our negative impact and really also support systems that create impacts on ecologies, environment, and communities. Now, circularity is a radical, restorative, regenerative shift in the way businesses operate. Currently, design in prim is primarily linear. Um, we've been really you know, uh, making, taking, and tossing, uh, contributing negatively to the detriment of our environment. And we, the built environment, because we're part of the built environment, uh, and the build industry, um, you know, have been contributing to carbon emission um, at a really very large rate globally. Um, so we buy, you know, quick consumption products uh, which are made cheaply, mostly, you know, um, and meant and meant to last only a short time. The production process is we really function still on this. The production process is meant to be fast and inexpensive, not giving much consideration to responsible sourcing or waste management. And then we use the, these items, you know, until they're quickly worn out and often these end up in the dump as well. So in a circular approach, the resources are kept in use for as long as possible. And then they are being reused refurbished, recycled, repurposed, and regenerated at the end of their service life. Um, you know, I often do that uh, movement, you know, just to add some visual, just to explain that, you know, we want to avoid, but we want to reduce the amount of waste that goes to the landfill. So rather than a life cycle with a beginning, middle, and the end, what we want to do is we want these items to you know, reborn countless times for countless use. Uh, we think longevity, uh, and mindfully we want to reduce the amount of resources and energy, energy consumed as well as the waste output. And um, to just add a visual um, to really what I am speaking about, um, I recently um, was invited at Hypon Market to design a sustainable um, vignette. It was uh, an activation program called the Sustainable Stories. And, uh, and so I was one of the designers designing a space. And you can see here um, that um, this space uh, was designed with uh, mainly circular um, products. And by that, I mean, you know, we worked with Cisco Home, um, Lee Beko, and Lensing Group, who um, provide the tensile fibers. And that so far that you see right there, for instance, um, is um, you know, the example of a circular um, pro uh, product. Uh, we have a Cisco home who works you know, really with certified wood um, and really strive to use healthy materials in um, the construction of their products, sofas and chairs. Uh, and um, we use the linen, uh, you know, flax linen, natural, which is like, you know, the second, second strongest fiber. Um, and this was provided by Libeco Home. Um, and then we had this collaboration with Lensing Group, who um, has this patent of tensile fibers that are circular fibers. Um, and they are made of tree pulp um, and, and, you know, transformed into fibers. Um, and, uh, and the feelings of his, uh, of his sofa uh, were with uh, lensing um, tensile fibers. So that's just, uh, you know, one of the examples um, that we did. Another example of circularity right here against the wall is from Philippe's collection. Um, you see these oil barrel covers that are used as wall decor. They are really a, 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 um, an example of using the waste of the waste. Um, they literally, you know, uh, went one day into a dump uh, place and, and and then you know uh, started to 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 collect these um, old ba uh, barrels um, covers and then they transformed them into um, this wall decor as you can see without you know without any uh, without even you know um, adding any um, finishes on their product. So just to um, wrap up on that and and then I pl um, please um, you know move on to the next uh, slide. Um, thank you. 
Um, just the circular approach, Michael, I mean, I really think is rooted in three principles, um, designing out waste and pollution, um, you know, keep products and materials in use as long as possible. Um, we really think longevity and then uh, in regenerating natural systems. And Laurence, could you take, for example, what we're looking at in this image? Can you give us a direct illustration of those three principles or one of those principles at work in, in this beautiful room? Oh, thank you. Um, yes, you know, I just gave this example of designing uh, out waste, um, uh, designing waste out, you know, um, so we just have this oil barrel you can see there. Um, you know, keep product and materials in use. Um, I would say I don't have it right in this image, um, but um, let's see. Um, Oh, I, I only see half of an image. Uh, maybe it's my connection, but I still see the old image and I don't see the new image. But it, uh, you know, nevertheless, um, one this, um, these chairs have been made with uh, no electricity, the wooden chair that are made by Aspen Golan. Um, they are made of wood, reclaim the wood. Um, and she used her hands, no electricity to custom made these um, chairs that are made of chestnut, reclaimed chestnut. Um, and another example, regenerative natural systems, you know, the linen, you know, flax linen, you know, from Libeco. I mean, you see the room is just with all these beautiful blankets, pillows, um, and upholstered uh, bed sofa. Um, so, so that's one example. Then, Ross, one of the facets that I um, am most fascinated by is regenerative materials. So what does it really mean that a material would go beyond protecting, but to actually improve the environment? Yeah, so these are materials, you know, that are creative from what would have otherwise become waste. Um, uh, in that sense, what I want to say is that, you know, it can be used in an endless cycle. Uh, they are being upcycled. Uh, you know, you literally, some artists and some of your guests, like yesterday, you had on your panel, you know, just go to, um, you know, some of the places, collect, you know, some of the waste and then transform the product, uh, which is another word for upcycle, you know, create a product out of waste or such as in this space that you see in the vignette, uh, these all barrels, uh, barrels covers are, you know, a transformed product from waste. Um, and we say, and you know, some of these items are, um, so as I was saying, you know, it's an endless cycle, upcycled and recycled into new, into new forms for new users. That's what regenerative means in that sense. You know, there's also these uh, new next gen um, materials, you know, some examples we see now and we talk about a lot are mycelium you know, made from mushrooms, which is a non-toxic, you know, insulating and all natural building materials. In textile, we have uh, marine cotton made from algae um, and reprieve fibers as well that are made of uh, rescued ocean plastics um, that can be reused to create fabrics, you know, such as denim and upholstery. So these are some examples. Great. <clears throat> Daniel, go, go to the next picture. Uh, oh, I see it slides up, but on the far left there, the, are those the chairs you were referring to that are made with reclaimed wood? Yes, yes. These are the chairs from Mill Collective. So we worked with Mill Collective and Mill Collective is a collective of, uh, of makers, artisan makers um, from all over that um, really truly, uh, you know, use uh, their craftsmanship uh, skills, you know, and, uh, and use different materials. And uh, this was one of the artists, um, her name is Aspen Golam, and uh, she's extremely talented and creates uh, a lot of wood product, um, you know, seating um, and, and other ones. Um, but in that chair, she did not use uh, electricity, to, you know, to even put some of these uh, nails or any of the joinery. Um, you know, it was from beginning to the end, just with her hands. This is the level of skills. So that's that's actually that's a great segue to the. Um, I'll ask. Let me ask one more question in this segment, and then we're going to talk to Jessica, and then circle right back to you. Um, chairs made by hand. 
what about on a larger scale basis? You know, you, you host and you produce Chez Laurence, the, the series on circularity in the industry. How are you seeing manufacturers designing out waste in their process? You know, who do so, who, who build not by the handful, but build by the thousands? Um, I think, you know, everybody is uh, making efforts and, you know, I'm really so inspired by my conversation with, you know, seeing progress and innovation um, these days with these manufacturers and companies. So Philips Collection, you know, I've made an art of using every piece um, of the tree um, and, uh, you know, including the root structure in the design and I think it really speaks I mean they really are a wonderful example of showing aesthetics but then yet you know they use um, really they, they strive to 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 that no waste you know um, mindset um, lensing fiber who creates these tensile fibers are referred to as a unique closed loop process that really prevents you know any water waste in the creation of a fibers um, more and Giles, uh, who use cowhides, cow hides, you know, leftover from factory farming to create gorgeous, sustainable leather. Uh, you know, they found, you know, creative uses for their scrap materials, um, and they turn small pieces into keychains and other accessories. Um, we also have Returnity, which is a packaging company that you know, Michael. We were on the panel together in the past. They focus right. on reducing packaging waste by innovating reusable options. And we all know how much we need to focus on packaging, and not only in this industry, but from any, any industry. And because we now all shop um, you know, uh, with a click, much more than we ever did before. Um, and then we have IKEA, who's piloting, you know, a take back program overseas, um, as you know, so customers can return pieces, they no longer have use for, so they can be turned into, you know, future furnishings. So I think there are an infinite, infinite number of ways uh, that waste can be addressed. Okay, these are, these are great specific examples. Uh, the holiday season's coming up. Think which of these do you want on your wish list for your, your holiday gift? And let's um, shift now to Jessica from Clea. We'll be back in a minute, Laurence. Thank you. Hi, Jessica. Hello. Let's, let's further demystify. Uh, first of all, I'll start with that. You're based in Greenpoint, Brooklyn, not in Long Island yes. City. So, <laughs> yes, <laughs> okay, we'll correct you. that. So let us know, tell us about yourself. Tell us about why did you start PLEA? What's the mission? Sure, um, thank you. And, and thank you so much for hosting this uh, important conversation. And it was so great to hear from Laurence and learn so many, um, uh, you know, so much about the work that she's doing and, and uh, to, to learn about those resources. Um, so my background is actually in product design. I was trained in product design, but my focus has been in uh, product and interior design. And for many years, I've worked in hospitality design. I have um, a picture on the right, which is uh, Rosewood Hong Kong, which I developed furniture for with Tony Chi Studio. Um, but but in, in um, working in hospitality, um, it, it led me to visiting furniture factories all over the world. And I'm also, as you mentioned, faculty at Parsons School of Design. Uh, and I began teaching around 2003, right when Cradle to, the book Cradle to Cradle came out. Um, so that influenced a lot of my um, thinking and practice as a designer and of course my teaching. And as everyone knows, Parsons is, is most known for uh, fashion design. And so a lot of the work that we were doing in the classroom was, was um, understanding uh, fast fashion and how to start to reduce the waste um, in, in all across many design industries. Um, but, but I started to be concerned about fast furniture and um, noticing a lot of the waste that's, that's coming from the furniture industry. So I sort of switched a little bit from hospitality to really looking at the home consumer market. And one of the ways that the PLEA first started was just literally taking uh, photographs, you can see this on the left, photographs of furniture that was discarded on the streets of New York. 
Um, and of course, following up that up with a little bit of research, uh, we found um, in 2017, the EPA reported that furniture um, uh, waste in the US was close to 12.2 million tons, 80% um, of which was um, just ended up in landfills. And just by going and, and starting to document and learn from the documentation of our own photographs, you know, you can see here how many materials are just being discarded. Um, that's not only wasteful in terms of the resources that were used and are not being um, recirculated, as Laurence had mentioned, but um, when these materials sit in a landfill, they release methane gas, which is uh, some of the most harmful greenhouse gases and, and contributes to climate change. Um, so this is really where we, we kind of got our start and, you know, just wanting to make a difference in this industry, but coming from uh, the expertise of knowing how products are made, knowing how furniture is made. And one of the things that uh, occurred to us is that in, in a factory, if you go to a furniture factory, there's hardly any waste. Um, because factories know that materials cost money, they, they can be recirculated, they can go back into the supply stream. And if you just go to the next slide, one of the first, um, uh, one of the greatest examples of this is aluminum. Um, if uh, you've been to a, a, an aluminum machining factory, you see that every single little dust and, and little shred of aluminum is collected because it has value. Um, it can be recirculated and aluminum especially uh, can be recycled for, uh, using less energy than it takes to create virgin aluminum. So this is actually an amazing material to think about how can we recirculate this? How can we start working with, with this material in a way that elevates it, um, but also um, you know, provides a way to go back into the supply stream? Um, so one of the things that really occurred to us is that the problem is that consumers do not have a network. Once you are, you know, if, if your table breaks or if something happens, you have no choice but to put it on the curb. So PLEA really started as a way to change the way we, we design and manufacture furniture to experiment, um, but also to experiment not only in materials and methods, but to experiment in how do we, how does the entire system work? Um, how do we provide instructions to the consumer? How do we think about end of, of product life as part of the entire product system? Um, and, and that involves um, uh, durability, as Laurence mentioned. So this idea of longevity, can you, you know, if you're going to keep a, a piece of furniture over a long period of time, how do you take care of it? How do you maintain it? Um, depending on the materials that we use, uh, maybe there, there's something different that you would do with it. Maybe it's not about recycling. Aluminum is great for recycling, but not every material is. So we, we, we thought of PLEA as a, as a way not just to change the way we design and, and produce products, but also to educate and, and collaborate with the consumer and, and to do this in a way um, where, where everyone knows what to do, whether that's a buyback system or recycling or even composting if, if we're using a natural material, that, that could be the end of life product life solution. Jessica, let me toss in two questions that came in as um, uh, two of our participants registered uh, to, to mix into your upcoming comments. What about greenwashing? You know, lots of products out there now are billing themselves as eco-friendly or with an eco footprint. How do we know the real deal from greenwashing? And the second question, does it matter if it, if it doesn't sell? Does it matter if it doesn't sell? That's a tough one. I think um, one of the things, just I'll start with that one. I, I think one of the things that's really important to us is that this is successful and, and, and that we do have a solution for consumers. Um, you know, uh, one of the, the quotes that we were always inspired by, um, uh, this quote was in the, the, um, the film nine episodes uh, for the Design Museum in London by Thomas Thwaites. And um, it's actually by Duncan Clark. He says, designers need to make products that are compatible with climate change and massively appealing. So in some ways we are working to kind of move the needle on you know, 
what you seek out as desirable in your home. It should naturally be sustainable. It should just be that already. Um, so we're definitely interested in um, making sure that we're making products that are elevated, that are desirable, that people want. That's how we're gonna start to shift this. Um, in terms of greenwashing, it's true. I think one of the telltale signs is, is to remember that there is not one single magic bullet that's going to solve um, sustainability in, in products and our stuff. It's important to remember that um, the supply chains, chains that exist and the way of manufacturing and selling furniture, it's been, um, you know, the system has not changed in a long time. Um, so it's very difficult. It's very complex. Uh, but but if there's if it sounds like there's one great solution, you know, that's something to be wary of. Um, one of the you know, ideas that's popped up recently is the idea of rentals, which is great. Furniture rental, that is, you know, that is a way towards circularity. If you keep um, furniture in, in the system and, and it can be continually reused. Uh, however, it, you know, that system falls apart if the furniture is not made correctly. So, um, you know, if, if a company wants to be renting furniture that was made, you know, at, for the you know, lowest bottom line and, and um, you know, is gonna fall apart within one to three years, then obviously this is not a system that works. So, you know, it's, it's about looking at, um, you know, the entire system. I would say traceability is a great um, way to, to kind of separate, you know, is this something that's truly sustainable? Is this something that's, that's um, really gonna, you know, lower the impact and, and have a lighter footprint. Um, where do the materials come from? Uh, what, what is the energy, water, and, and um, environmental impact that, that happens during the production phase, not just at the end of life? Um, so I think there's a lot of factors uh, to, to look into and just be wary if it seems like there's you know, a perfect solution. It's, it's very complex sure. and, and we need to kind of change our thinking depending on each one. Um, let's let's go ahead go to, to some the, of your great looking uh, products. So that, thank you. Yeah, I was gonna just mention one of the things in terms of getting past this complexity is um, that we're here to experiment um, and we're collaborative. So we work with many different designers and artists um, and, and we, we really want to um, stay innovative. You know, we, we believe that the answer here is in innovating and experimenting and exploring new materials. Um, and these uh, vases and objects are by the artist Yasmin Bawa, who's based in Berlin. And she has been experimenting with hempcrete, uh, which is a carbon negative process. So the, the actually casting with hempcrete um, pulls carbon out of the atmosphere and, and is, is um, very light on, on, on the environment in terms of replacing certain materials like possibly um, uh, cement or concrete um, and also porcelain, um, which, which takes a lot of um, energy in the firing and, and, and all of that. So this is one example. Um, I think another example is just looking at materials a little bit differently um, this is rattan. So, and even the top is rattan. And, and one of the things that um, struck us in our research is that um, we found some statistics that the average American throws away their sofa or chair every five to seven years. And we know that it takes a tree about 30 years to grow to its full potential uh, before it gets cut down and turned into furniture in our industry. So we started thinking, you know, can we replace this and at least, you know, be, be a little bit in line with the way we use our stuff. So it is sad. We don't want to condone throwing anything away. But if that's the reality of the system that we're in, we started looking at how, you know, is there another material that can replace wood? And it's not easy, you know, experimenting across these materials, um, you're up against um, industries who haven't worked with it in a particular way. So um, a lot of our work is experimental. This is a, a little stool that's not um, on the market yet, but, but still in process, but every part of it is rattan. And, and there we're starting to um, experiment with uh, using it in a, a way that people haven't seen before to elevate it a little bit. Um, another example, you can go to the next slide is 
in textiles and and this kind of speak and that's edgar everyone our <laughs> happy um studio mate um but in terms of textiles um th this is the work of laura sansone someone a textile designer that we collaborate with and also an incredible researcher and innovator in in sustainability um, and, and this speaks to regeneration. So, so Laura uh, runs New York Textile Lab and a lot of her work is connecting directly to the farms. Um, so the farms uh, where um, uh, the fibers um, come from, alpaca and sheep. Um, and, and, and what her work has been doing is thinking about the system from a decentralized aspect. So, in, instead of you know looking at a, a connection of many farms and and bringing them into a way of working um, where um, the farms can be um, climate neutral depending on the way that um, they treat the animals the soil the water um, and then of course we're um, using wind and solar um, on on the farm so uh, some of the work is it, it's not necessarily just about the material but we are showing here um, uh, some of her, her woven products and knitted blankets and, and then the um, pillow on the left is naturally dyed with indigo. So um, what's exciting about this work, these, these textiles, is that they're completely compostable. Um, we just recently had an exhibit showing a lot of her process, which we called Soil to Soil, because it's thinking about beginning with the soil um, that the animals are raised on, and then of course ending with something that is so light on, on the environment that it can also go right back into the soil with no harm. Jesse, let me, let me inject here, and then we're gonna pull um, Laurence back in, that in addition to the examples that Laurence gave of regenerative, what does it really mean? I think you just gave another amazing, great example where the, the material itself is uh, compostable at the end of its useful life in, in its current form. So that it's not only, um, it, has a, it has a place to go, not just to the trash, and that where it goes back into the earth is actually regenerative for the, for the earth itself. Um, Lawrence, come back in. And let me point out, while we're making the transition, uh, there are a couple of great um, uh, resources in the chat. One, uh, when we were talking about vetting sustainable furniture for greenwashing versus the real deal, from Urbis Eco, you'll see a comment from Christina Cobb. There's a guide online. Also, the Sustainable Furnishings Council website is tremendously helpful in this regard. And take a note of the two um, uh, links from the Healthy Materials Lab and from uh, Hemp picture, hemp picture. <laughs> okay, so let me turn it over, Jessica and, and Laurence. Um, uh, it's your chance. Jessica, uh, wonderful uh, hearing um, all your responses and, you know, uh, giving some new example um, of uh, circularity with your, with uh, the products. I have a question for you. Um, uh, why is uh, PLIA at the higher end of a market? Um, don't we want regenerative design to be accessible? Uh, don't we need to scale? It's a great question, thank you. Um, I think it, it, it is a tough one. And, and actually, if we had a choice, it would not necessarily be at the high end of the market. But I, I wanna point back to, um, uh, just working within the systems that, that we're in. Um, and, and a lot of the work that we're doing as, as we do research and try to find the best solution and, and really, um, you know, really try to do better ourselves. It's, it, we find that we are reinventing things at every step. So um, we have to rebuild these systems. Um, we, uh, we have to build more. So we, we uh, you know, sometimes we fail, we don't get it right. So we try again, we, we go back with our manufacturers, we go back to the designer, we go back to the artist and, and together we, we try to do better. So, um, you know, at, at this point, you know, by, by reinventing everything every step of the way and kind of building it from scratch, um, you know, we, we definitely can't compete with Ikea. So it's exciting to hear that they're doing, a, you know, a take back program. That's, 
very important, but I, I think that's something to consider as well. Um, this is a complex problem and it takes a lot of invention. It takes a lot of imagination. It takes, you know, kind of step-by-step -step learning as we go, everyone learning together and sharing resources. Um, again, there's not one simple, easy solution. We kind of got ourselves into these um, systems as, as we, you know, kind of aimed for the bottom line in, in furniture and, and in home products. And I think that's what we're, we're sort of climbing out of. I hope that helps to. <laughs> Absolutely, it does, it does. Would you like to ask me a question? Sure, I, I'm curious, um, maybe with your clients, if you ever uh, come up with um, any challenges to you know, kind of moving in, in a sustainable direction, whether it might be material-based or price or, or any, anything, um, how, how do you, do you have any go-to strategies for um, working with clients who, who, you know, aren't on board? Yes, that's a great question. Thank you so much for asking. Um, yes, definitely. I mean, most of our clients, you know, uh, come to us because uh, they obviously aware of the, the, um, you know, the direction we take. But uh, when we have um, clients that are a bit reticent for one reason or another, sometimes it's, uh, you know, most of the time it's budget, uh, you know, uh, or sometimes it's an aesthetic, you know, it really is very, very set in their ways, um, the way they think and they love a product or a brand, you know, you know how um, this happens. Um, I really, try my team and I we really strive to explain um, the benefit of health health is one of the first strategy that we uh, really propose and uh, and really ask uh, okay so you have you know a child uh, would you like your child to sit on that carpet and know that it's emitting chemicals that you're not even aware of um, you know, and um, or would you prefer that we uh, suggest, you know, a couple of brands uh, that might be more beneficial, you know, to you indoor air quality, um, as we now know <laughs> that, you know, indoor air quality is everything, uh, one of the most important thing to think about. Um, so um, when we put it that way, um, I think that's when they become aware. Because the first step with consumers, and, and we all are consumers, you know, this is not just with um, uh, clients and while we are designing interiors, it is also when we go to our rep um, and we really ask questions, what is the product made of? You know, where did you source it? And as you beautifully pointed out, um, you know, it's very important to, highlight and really talk about the life cycle assessment of a product you know where was it sourced where was the raw product you know the raw uh, you know a uh, uh, product uh, uh, source how was it made by who was it made you know um, and then transported then brought to you know the retail place the showroom or to the interior whether it's commercial hospitality or residential and then what's the longevity you know and how does the end user will use it anyway all these questions are very important to ask um, and the more we ask and and really talk about this um, the more we we can have this conversation and really put health uh, forward really really uh, really really explain that uh, planetary, planetary health is inextricably linked with human health. Um, and I think, you know, since the pandemic, there's a real awareness of that. In our really, unfortunately, short time left, let me pose a one sentence question to, to both of you. If you could encourage consumers to ask one question to help advance this agenda, what would it be? Uh, Laurence, you want to start? To ask one question to, to who? To, to a retailer or to a manufacturer or to their interior designer? Um, I would really say, uh, really ask, as I said, you know, where, where did you source your materials? Mm -hmm. um, where did it come from? Um, if I understand correctly your question, you know, yes. and I would ask, are there any standard certifications? There are so many, 
um, and and I think uh, you know this helps to in a, in a, in a logical way understand um, that there's a certain level of safety knowing that they've been recognized by an organization. Yeah, that was exactly my question. Um, where did you source your materials, and are there certifications that we can look to for reliability? Jessica, you want to take the same question? I'll I'll just add um, uh, what to do if it breaks. So. Um, and it speaks to something we, we didn't really talk about, but this idea of extended producer responsibility, it's not something that, you know, we're used to at all, but if, if um, producers take responsibility, then they should be able to tell a consumer, you know, how to care for it, how to increase longevity, um, what to do at the end of that life cycle, that product life cycle, what to do if you're moving and you can't take it with you. Um, so to, to just be um, a little bit res more responsible in, in the entire um, life of the product, um, to, to see it as a little bit more than just a product, but something that came from the earth that we need to care for and um, has environmental consequences. Um. Take a look uh, in the chat. There's a feedback form. We'd love to get your feedback. Uh, to take out your pens uh, and note info at mebelfurniture.com. There is a number of you, Pearl, Adrian, Christine, Connor, Derek, Ferdos, Leslie, Lauren, Samantha, and Susan. Each of you submitted terrific questions. If you didn't feel they were fully answered, email us and we promise to get back to you. Info at Mebel Furniture, M-E-B-L Furniture.com. We'll, we'll be sure to get back to you. Um, thank you so much, Laurence. Thank you, Jessica. Uh, thank you, Sustainable Furnishings Council for teaming up with us on this. Uh, thank you, NYC by Design for hosting the entire festival this week, which by the way, goes on for several more days. Um, check them out at NYC uh, Design, um, NYCXDesign.com. And we will see you soon. We really appreciate you joining us today. Thank you. Thank you so much.